Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, April 17th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from Renfield, editor Ryan Folsey. I'm like, look, there's a lot of comedy in here. There's a lot of horror, like real scary stuff. How are we going to play this? It was a fun ride kind of all the way through, yet there was some learning processes that were going to be happening during this movie to see how Renfield really developed to have this strength and power to match Dracula at the end. Him and John had their cutting rooms and they were right next to Belushi and Aykroyd's writing room. And so my dad would have to go into a meeting and I mean, it was literally like nine or ten. And he's like, hey, uh, I got to go. So I'm going to drop you next door. They're going to keep an eye on you. So don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. Yes, all that and more in this edition of The Rough Cut. And so we meet again, my dear friends. Thank you very much for giving me a little time out of your day so I can introduce you to some very talented people in the world of post-production. People like today's guest, editor Ryan Folsey. Ryan is here to talk about, among other things, his new film Renfield. What's Renfield? Well, it stars Nicolas Cage as Dracula. How much more does one need than that? For me, the answer is nothing, but I'll give you a little context anyway. It's a comedy, because Nicolas Cage stars as Dracula, for one thing. But it's also a modern-day story about a man named Renfield. That must be where they got the title from. Renfield is Dracula's servant, what's known as a familiar in vampiric circles. And he has been for many, many years. But he's tired of it. Even though the job benefits include having superhero-like powers, those powers are used to kill innocent people and then bring them to Dracula for his unique dietary needs. Renfield just can't take that anymore, and he tries to break free by joining a self-help group. That kind of works. But what works better is teaming up with a renegade cop played by Aquafina. So it's got jokes. It's got action. It's got a lot of blood. How do you mix that recipe together in the cutting room? Well, that is why Ryan is here. And we will meet him right after a quick word about the fine folks who helped to bring you this podcast. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, and clearly you are, let's not kid ourselves, you have it in your mind to make some great TV shows and or movies. And when you do, of course, you want them to sound great. And the best way to do that is to go see our friends and Rough Cut sponsor, Extreme Music. For over 25 years, they have been the ones that educated storytellers have turned to for the very best in production audio. Music created by the best and brightest names in the business. Legends, I tell you. And then again, some of them aren't legends. But they are all incredible artists who can help your project sound amazing. All you gotta do is go to ExtremeMusic.com and search their enormous catalog of tunes with metadata like genre, tempo, instrumentation, lyrics, stuff like that. Something that I think is even more fun is that you can just upload a track to Extreme Music, and they will use their powers to find you ones just like it. You can get your tracks in different links. You can get your tracks with different instruments. You can do it all right there in their website. Or if you need a little help with that licensing, you can talk to a real person at an office near you. So the next time you have a big movie or TV show to make, well, go make it and make it with those musical geniuses at Extreme Music. All right, pals, you ready to sink your teeth into this one? I know, I know. From Renfield, here's editor Ryan Folsey. They had face painting? I've never been to a movie that has face painting. Wow. They were all in. You know, I was talking to an editor a few weeks ago, and I was trying to figure out how to start the conversation with him. And I thought I would try kind of a random question, and that was, what was the last thing you were working on before the edit was done? And that actually paid off, even though it's not a great question, but I thought I'd try it again with you. So, Ryan, what was the last thing you were working on with uh, Renfield? Um, I would probably say the CODA meetings. I was on CODA meetings like crazy. That was my jam. We tweaked that thing till the end. There are so many versions of that, that sequence that uh, live out there that are pretty amazing. I mean, Brandon was amazing. You know, Nick was awesome. All the other characters in that sequence. Uh, Chris really covered it well. There were so many options you could go with that sequence. So I think that was probably the last one I worked on because I was always tweaking it, you know. I think kind of the, I did a lot of the the fight sequences and the stuff at the end. We were definitely always kind of tweaking that area. I think when Cage comes into the CODA meeting at the end, I was just kind of CODA meeting guy for a while. I was like, Chris, give me something else, man. You're killing, you know, but it, it was a lot of fun in the end. I think those were pivotal scenes um, to see kind of where, where Renfield was kind of going in, in his kind of path towards kind of standing up to Dracula. So uh, I, I enjoyed them. So as far as what this movie is about, 
I thought I'd ask you about how you describe this movie, not so much in plot, but really more in genre and style. Wow. Okay. I would say genre and style. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's a tough one to put your finger on. And I'll kind of go back to when I first got pulled onto it. I talked to Chris about it a little bit just to see like what the script was about. Once I saw this, you know, the script and read through it, it was a fun ride kind of all the way through, yet there was some learning processes that were going to be happening during this movie to see how Renfield really developed to become kind of not his own Dracula, but to have this strength and power to match Dracula at the end. And I'm like, look, there's a lot of comedy in here. There's a lot of horror, like real scary stuff. How are we going to play this? Because I I mean, I did Cabin Fever years ago, and that was kind of a fine line with Eli also talking to him about how we're going to kind of manage this. I did like a goofy club dread with the Broken Lizard guys, and that was definitely way more super campy and stuff. But then we wanted to go scary. And it's like, if you go too scary in some of those sequences and you go too goofy on the other side, you're just not going to match it up and you're not going to believe either side, really. So for me, that was kind of a tough area to navigate. My dad did American Werewolf in London. And so growing up as a kid, I'd go into the cutting rooms with him all the time, with him and John. And uh, seeing how they navigated that was one of those kind of benchmark movies that I always kind of go back to when you're dealing with the horror and the comedy. And I remember calling my dad when I was working on this a couple of times and saying, okay, what do you think about this? And, and uh, cause it really has an American werewolf kind of path to it. So that was always the one I looked at. We had a lot of hyper violent sequences and a lot of like kind of more goofy comedy stuff than American Werewolf in London. But I think American Werewolf in London kind of bases some of that stuff in reality. You know, when Griffin comes back and he's, you know, torn apart and stuff, there are funny little jokes in there, but it's based on this reality of this guy has been torn apart and you're trying to kind of find the comedy in this area. And it can be, it can be really tough. You can really be off putting to an audience or you can nail it. And in this one, that was kind of my biggest concern because you go the wrong way and audiences are like ripcord, we're out, you know. Yeah. I came on actually after they shot. So Mako had been on it working. I had finished Adam's Family, you know, so I was doing more of the animation stuff. And then I jumped off in uh, Adam's Family and they were like, hey, can you come on to help us out on Renfield? I'm like, sure, I'd love to. I haven't been back in live action in a while, but I love live action. So when I came on, that was really kind of the first area I looked at was how do you guys want to navigate this? You know, Chris is so open to trying so many different things. I mean, I, I've worked with people in the past that like, hey, show me another version, show me another version, show me. And he's really like, I need to see everything here to really understand, you know, where we should go ahead with this cut. So, yeah, I think for me, like uh, references would have been more like definitely American Werewolf in London. I didn't know if we were going like the Evil Dead route. Are we going like, you know, how crazy is this going to get? And um, I think we kind of found our own way and that movie kind of became what it what it is. You know, it really kind of developed and and what started as a little bit darker and a little bit more serious comedy got a little bit like sillier in the comedy and not quite as dark in the violence and stuff. So it was just kind of a push and pull the entire movie. You know, I, I like really dark. So like I would show cuts and be like, how about this? And it was like pretty gnarly, you know? And I was like, I just really like going heavy dark. I want to see, I want to scare the shit out of people if possible, if we got the footage and we had the footage in some areas. And it's sometimes if you go too dark there, you could hurt yourself on the other side. So I think it was just a give and take process. You've done a couple of other films with Renfield director, Chris McKay, specifically from the Lego movie franchise, but he was not the director of the ones that you share a credit with him. Correct. Rather, he was a voice actor on the ones that you cut. So I have a hard time thinking that those were the connection that brought you two together for Renfield, but maybe it was. So tell me about first meeting Chris and getting this particular job. So I had been working in live action for years, and then I really wanted to, you know, kind of pivot and get into more hybrid movies or animation. I kind of come from more of an art background, and I've always kind of wanted to work in animation, but I was always told, like, no, you're in live action. Everybody wants to go from animation to live action. That's the goal. And look, I love live action, but for me, animation is 
a wonderful place to be working. I love working in animation. I love working with the board artists. They're such talented people. They're storytellers. And if you give them the reins to really make a scene amazing, it, it's incredible what they can come up with. So I started to pivot a little bit. I'd worked with Walt Becker on a couple of movies. We did Van Wilder years ago. We did Wild Hogs and Old Dogs and some like big kind of silly comedies. And uh, he, I'm trying to think what I was working on. He got a Chipmunks movie and he calls me. He's like, hey, I'm doing a Chipmunks movie. Do you want to do it? And I was like, not a chance. You know, <laughs> I just, I just didn't know what it was. You know, I was like, I don't know. That's not really my jam. I don't know if I really want to do a Chipmunks movie. And then I saw, I kind of looked at a clip of something. I was like, oh, okay, this has got some CG elements. This has got some interesting levels to it. If I want to get into animation, I think this might be a good call to like kind of take on. And and I don't like being pigeonholed. Like I think when I came out the gates, I was in cabin fever and it was like, people like, oh, you're the horror guy, do horror, blah, 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 blah. And it's like something I just didn't really want to get stuck in. I wanted to do comedy. I wanted to do action. I just wanted to try everything. It's definitely something that my dad was always kind of pivoting and moving around. Granted, he was kind of the comedy guy with Landis, but he liked doing horror. He liked the American werewolves. He liked doing these other kind of movies. He did some work on Great Santini. And like, you know, so he always tells me these stories of these movies that he worked on that were so opposite of what he was kind of known for. So I kind of always took that as my kind of game plan to just duck and move. And when people try to pigeonhole me, I'd be like, oh, I'm over here. No, I'm over here. I kind of did that thing. So when I got on to Chipmunks, uh, we had an amazing team, just a fantastic group of people, like our VFX blockers and um, assistants and everybody involved really kind of knew the game. So I was kind of the new guy kind of learning it. But once I realized the steps and how it how it kind of functioned in terms of like the stuffy pass with the stuffed animals doing all the work, like I didn't even understand how it was going to be built in the Avid. I kind of, you know, talked with some people about it. But once I realized the levels it takes to get to the final animation of these characters in a space with live action actors, it was just a huge learning curve for me. And I really like got just sunk my teeth into it and uh, just enjoyed it. I, I just I loved working on it. I loved seeing how the process went, understanding how the actors have to work against nothing and then building those pieces in and then creating so many different avenues for these little characters to function and stuff. And once you started to see how they were moving in the room and in the space and the scenes, it was just a lot of fun. Really, really difficult because you're dealing with focal planes. It's unlike animation where you kind of build your own focal planes and you build your own world. So those were areas I needed to understand and learn and uh, work with the studio. Karen Rosenfeld was the producer on it and she was fantastic. It was a tough show, but in the end, the studio was really happy with it. And then from that, I got um, an interview to work on Scoob over at Warner Brothers. And I met with Allison Abate and Tony Cervone, who directed it. And uh, we just kind of hit it off and got along great. They had been working on it for a little while and I kind of jumped in and then just started, they kind of had a new pass of the script and I started kind of recutting some of the older stuff and then building in the new sequences with the storyboards and stuff like that. That's how I just started getting into the animation. And then while I was on Scoob, they went down for a period and I was learning pretty fast on that too. Cause it was like storyboards and layout and all that stuff. I was like, okay. I was like, Hey, how do you do Like I was researching and doing all kinds of stuff. Cause I just wanted to keep doing it and didn't want to get caught that I probably didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so then all of a sudden they said, Hey, um, I talked to some of the people at Warner brothers and said, Hey, we were doing this movie called Ninjago. We're kind of in a period. We're trying to fix some stuff. We're going to bring in Chris McKay from the first Lego movie and Robot Chicken and all this stuff. And he's going to kind of spearhead it. Can you go over and meet with the uh, the editor? And I said, sure. So I went over, met with them, got along great. So Scoob kind of shut down for just a little bit. And then I was over there on Ninjago for about, I think it was about a year or something, but three or four months. And then you know, I met Chris and it was definitely intimidating because I knew where he came from. And I was like, oh, my God, it's Chris McKay. He's going to catch me. He's going to find out I'm an idiot. You know, it's like that whole like imposter syndrome steps in when you move into a different genre, you know. But he could not have been nicer. And he uh, he really kind of took me under his wing. He was so respectful of my live action background and kind of leaned into it. And was, he's like, look, I want to make like I want to turn this movie into something different. And once I read the script and I and I saw Garmadon and Lloyd and all that stuff for me, it was just like 
and seeing how the Lego world works. I just was so excited. And he ended up taking me down to Sydney for about three or four months with a couple of other guys. And we all kind of split up into like kind of real uh, captains and everybody kind of grabbed a reel and just recut and reanimated all this stuff. And so I think by the time I was done with that, he really trusted me in, in what I was doing as an editor and knew I had the movie's best interest at heart always. And I, I work pretty insane hours, whether I clock them in or not. I'm like the guy that's like has to get ripped off the avid at night. Just because <laughs> like if you get into a scene and you're really sinking your teeth in, I just really love to try different versions, try different ways to make a joke work. Justin Thoreau and everybody in that movie was just fantastic with their improvs, doing their ADR and stuff. So it was really one of those things by the end, like after all these people were on that show, I was one of the last people standing with Chris on the mix stage. And then they went off to do um, there. I think he was going to do Borderlands or something else. Then I went back to Scoob, finished up Scoob. Actually, before Scoob, I did Smallfoot, then went back to Scoob. So I was kind of like staying in that animation world with Warner Brothers. And they just kind of kept putting me on projects. And I kept learning more and more. It's almost like this, like four or five year, like, college career of like understanding animation from the ground up. And I needed that. I needed that to understand how animation works, but I got to see it at a lot of different levels. And then to go through that period with Chris to see how he functions in a fast paced, you know, lightning quick post-production period was definitely beneficial, you know? And then I think towards the end of that, I said, look, I got to go back on the scoop. They were going to go do, I think Borderlands or something else. And I couldn't really do it at the time. And then they did Tomorrow War. I was on Adam's Family. And then at the end, we just kind of met up again. And he brought me in and he was like, thank you so much for coming in. Let's do it. So I just kind of started digging in on Renfield like I did on Ninjago. And it's kind of the same thing. You know, it's just he has a plan, wants to see options. You know, he's he's definitely he's he can be tough, but he's like respectful. And I learn a lot every time I'm working with him. Well, there have been countless takes on the character of Dracula. Countless. See what I did there, Ryan? I like that. That was good. I like that. Please don't hang up on me. <laughs> but you kind of stole my thunder a little bit in that, well, I'll just tell you that I was reading that Nicolas Cage said he was inspired by an American werewolf in London for this film, mm. which was produced by your dad, George Volsey Jr. Right. And you mentioned talking to him and, and getting advice from him, I think specifically about the balance of comedy and horror. I'd be pretty foolish not to ask you what you asked him and what he said back to you. Yeah, I mean, that was... Really, I think he was just kind of excited that I was working in this genre, you know. He's definitely a person that when it comes to the editing process, he's always got sound advice. We've always jumped in each other's cutting rooms and, and talked about stuff. I've been lucky enough to grow up in his cutting room. I never went to film school. I didn't go to camp. My mom sent me to, he had an office at Universal Studios and I went there and I was like, you know, acting like I was working there. And like, I mean, I was only 10 when they were doing Blues Brothers, but I was a really lucky kid to have seen what I saw as a fly on the wall as a little kid. Cause he, his office was next to him and John had their cutting rooms and they were right next to Belushi and Aykroyd's writing room. And so my dad would have to go into a meeting and I mean, it was literally like nine or 10 and he's like, Hey, uh, I got to go. So I'm going to drop you next door. They're going to keep an eye on you. So don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. So he would like walk me over there and Belushi and Acro would be sitting there like, Hey, little Fulzy, come on in. And like, they bring me in. Literally my dad would close the door. They would flip me, put me inside a film bin, cover me in fill and then like take me outside and then push me in these film bins, like down the hill. I'd be like, ah! you know, like freaking out. They just tortured me, but in a fun way. And I remember my dad, and I didn't know who these guys were, you know, and my dad would pick me up. I'm like, don't ever leave me with those guys again, dad. That was crazy. And he's just laughing. And I'm just like, and I look back now and it's like, I was so blessed to be a part of that. And I'm so lucky that they tortured me, you know, but, uh, but anyway, so I kind of spent my years uh, always over there, always on set with him. Um, if I did sit in the cutting room, it was with him and John, it was, oh, they would show me stuff and they would say, Oh, what do you, what do you think of that? And then I couldn't just say, that's good. That's bad. I always had to give a reason why, you know? So why do you think that's funny? Why is this? I'm like, Oh, I like how you cut to this person. It just made me laugh. It was like a reaction cutter they were looking for. And I was kind of like their little audience member at times to just kind of just give my two cents. I mean, obviously, I did it more as I was older, like Blues Brothers. I was pretty young, but watching those guys put those dance numbers together on eight plates was pretty crazy. You know, I mean, 
if you look at some of those dance numbers and you realize that somebody is not just on an avid where you could pop versions and group clips so fast and see all those cameras, they got him on an eight plate and he's got a junior going so he could see all the cameras synced into the song and just pulling clips. And I would I'd sit there and help him cut clips and hang them in bins. And I was like, this is the most tedious thing I've ever seen in my life. Not a chance do I want to do this when I grow up. And here I am. So, <laughs> but I didn't realize it, but he was really kind of teaching me a lot about editing and the process and uh, why you're cutting to where you are cutting. That's a big one, you know, because I would show him stuff. He's like, why are you cutting that guy? And I was like, thank you. You know, and it's like sometimes you, you do see those arbitrary cuts. And, uh, you know, he always had a reason for his cuts, you know, and I love that. So left with Belushi and Ackroyd, huh? Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I wonder if they had child protective services back then. <laughs> I doubt it. So you mentioned that you joined after production had completed. I, I believe that's what you said. Yeah. Yeah. So you take on the job. What do you do to get integrated, to get your setup the way you like it? What do you do to really just jump right in with both feet? Um, first, I would usually start to watch their cuts just to see where it's going. You know, I obviously go through the script and like really like hone in on areas that I think, you know, are important. I'll always circle stuff in the script as I'm going like, that's a big scene. That's a bit, that one's pivotal. We've got to nail this. And then just started going to see like where they were at at that point. I think Chris really wanted to try some new stuff in some of the cuts and Mako had done, you know, a whole bunch of different versions, a certain pass of her, you know, the music that she thought worked in there. And I think he's, he kind of gave us the mantra, like, just try new stuff. Let's just try to flip it on a couple of areas. And he really was like, Hey, I kind of want you in the code of meetings. You know, I, he kind of wanted me on the Garmadon, like emotional beats in Ninjago. And like, if it comes to like those emotional moments where things have to really lock in, he kind of gave me the reins to really try some stuff, especially with character development or moments where like, there's a big turn for somebody. He really was kind of empowering me to do that. So he really handed me those codas. It's like, okay, go through this footage. Cause it was <laughs> quite a bit of footage. And start really fine tuning some of this stuff with Brandon and, and really not make his Brandon in that scene can get really big and over the top and do stuff. And he just wanted to kind of this slow burn where you're really believing this guy. This guy is there for Renfield. He's going to get him to this place, even though he has no idea that his actual boss is Dracula. Keep that hidden as long as we can. You know what I mean? Obviously. But um yeah, that was kind of the area he really kind of wanted me to focus on, which I loved. I love jumping into that stuff. You know, I think Nick was fantastic. I think he gave so many different options. Brandon was that guy is amazing as an actor. I mean, Mark in the in the movie is, is so much fun. So, yeah, I think that was kind of a, a, a good time. As far as how you like to set up the Avid itself, if I drop by your cutting room, what would I see? I know we were, we wanted to go five one, but we were too late in the game to really kind of change it all. We were moving so fast and we had, we had, you know, screenies coming up and previews. I know Gian had that vertical monitor in the middle. I've worked with, you know, a lot of people that do that. I'm kind of, I can just sit down and just go on anything. Like I kind of build it as I go. So I'm, I'm probably not much of a, you know, I got my big monitor or I got my big monitor. I got in three others, you know, so for me, it's, you know, I've just been doing the same kind of thing. Uh, it's what I'm comfortable with. I'm not like a big, you know, gadget guy and that kind of stuff. I've all respect for that when people get exactly how they want it. But I'm like, I just give, I'm a trackball guy. I'm like, just give me a trackball and I'm good to go. Well, you mentioned them a few times now. You co-edited the film with uh, Giancarlo Gonziano. I believe I'm getting his yeah. name right. And yeah. Mako Kamitsuna. Yeah. How do you divide the work with the co-editors? You mentioned that a lot of the work you did was in the codependency group meetings. Do you three have a chance to really get together and talk about the project and how you want to approach it and how you want to divide it up? Right. Well, Mako, she finished up at the end of production and she was off the show after that. And then Gian and I were both brought in right at the, at uh, once production was over in LA. So Gian and I came in at the exact same time. He had worked on Tomorrow War and then Noah Cody, who was one of the assistants, is also like Chris's right hand guy. And he was cutting a ton of stuff and he is super talented. He's one of those people. It's just like you kind of want to just say to them, OK, just stop assisting. Just you need to just add it. And some people like can cut and some people can do assistant work. 
And some people are just meant to cut. He's one of those guys that he should just keep cutting. He did a, he did a lion's share of the work. I think he was there with Chris, you know, that was like his right arm, you know, always in the editing room. Chris would give him stuff to work on and try some stuff and dig into this and find this. And he's super talented kid. He's definitely going to have a great career. Um, I'd work with him any day of the week, but, uh, yeah, we kind of really between Chris and Gian and I and Noah, we all just kind of had a plan. We would show things to Chris. Chris would note them up. We would just, you know, move things around. Hey, now you go on to this scene that this person was working on and you take a crack at that. And it was just like, it was always, you know, moving. It was a very fluid cutting style. So everybody, if you tried to pull ego or tried to pull ownership on a scene, you're out. And like, you just got to like, no ego. Chris is always going to have final say on your stuff. And you can, you know, fight for things and talk to him about stuff. But, you know, he has it's he's the director. We work for the director and um, he knows what he wants. So I think between all of us, it was really like we divided and conquered. Yeah, they would put me on Coda. And I'd usually be like, I'm sorry, guys, I'm still on Coda. But there's so much footage. It's insane. But, yeah, we would always jump back and forth. We got to get into, you know, some of the stuff with Renfield and Dracula and the apartment. I did a lot of that stuff. I did a lot of the. You know, just, I mean, I touched every single scene. We cut everything, you know, multiple times. I mean, the amount of versions we have of each scene is pretty staggering. So I want to ask you a little bit about something that I don't typically ask often, and that is focusing on the clarity of dialogue. As you know, Dracula has a bit of an accent. And then in the film, he's at various states of disrepair. True. So your ability to understand what he's saying, is that something that you paid any attention to or had any tools that you used to make sure that the dialogue was coming through clearly? We did have some plugins that we ended up using. I think some of the toughest areas were with Cage having the prosthetic on. That was really tough. So we definitely had to do some voice, you know, repair on that stuff. If if we were using the production, I mean, Nick is incredible in ADR and stuff. He's just nailing stuff. I mean, he's so good. Those dialogue tracks, they were all pretty clean and we could isolate. We were a lot of times cutting with, I think we had eight tracks coming in, whether it was the boom, the lav or any other sort of, you know, recording device they were using. So we could really, if you found an area, you could always match back, match back again, get back to that original production sound because we would, we kept that in the Avid. And then you could really find what's the best read. You know, I think the Coda meeting did have a lot of echo on it. And I know that the sound department did a lot of work to kind of clean all that stuff up and they did a great job. For me, I always try to hand over the project to the sound people with the best, cleanest sound they could possibly get. And then they can work from there. I'm not the person that like, hey, here's the mono track. Uh, good luck. It's got crap all over it. <laughs> like we, that's like, that's not going to happen with us. You know, like we were a crew that was very detailed in getting them the best stuff possible for sure. Well, earlier I said, I'd be crazy not to ask you about what kind of advice your dad gave you about editing. Likewise, I'd be crazy not to follow up on the whole, you know, what Nicolas Cage gave you in, in terms of performance. Did he do a lot of improv? I want to know what those dailies look like when you get them from Nicolas Cage. Pretty fantastic. He's everything that you you would think he would be as an actor. He's he's so in it. It's just amazing. Like, but you, you know, like you could see him like, you know, after takes, like, you know, going to Chris or, or or talking to the script supervisor and like workshopping, what if I did this or something? And then and then he would come back and then try something. But some of those like long diatribes of dialogue that he's doing. I mean, they're like, some of those are, I mean, they even got cut up. They're one takers and he is going off full character all in. You know, I think in the end, the studio, I think we took out a couple of little areas where he was like, I think in the, the stuff with him and Renfield in the, in the um, apartment where he's kind of coming at him, stalking him. And like, there's some really funny stuff in there, but boy, take after take, he was, he was pretty scary because he was just allowing Renfield to just bullshit in front of him. And he just sitting there taking it. all those takes. He's doing just really funny, like responses to all of Renfield's like dialogue. He had so many different versions of how he was just just his reactions to what Holt was doing was classic, you know, and then he would give some responses and some were funny. Some were really scary. He just gave you options. You can't ever say that he didn't give you everything because that guy, he'll give you everything, you know, and it's, it's pretty impressive. You just got to line them up and make sure they're all matching 
as best as possible. You know, I think for something like that, we kind of went for a little bit of a funnier pass through that scene, but we had passes that were, you thought he was, you, he was going to kill him. There is one particular gag I wanted to ask you about. Renfield comes home to his studio apartment to find Dracula waiting for him. And then there's a cut to his welcome mat that says, welcome, come on in. And that got a pretty good laugh. I loved it because I'm familiar with the vampire mythology in that in order for a vampire to come in, they have to be invited in. That's not something you guys set up. You didn't explain that mythology ahead of time. And actually, you went back to that beat again later on when Dracula comes into the CODA meeting. So was there ever any talk about we need to establish why this is funny? That was one for me. I, I was like, do we need to set this up? You know, I definitely thought about it. But once we saw it with an audience, they're pretty well versed. They get it. That vampire lore, there's a lot of people that kind of know those tricks and those games and those jokes and stuff like that. And so I was really surprised that it was how well that that joke was received. We just kind of let it be. I'm, I, I'm assuming that was probably Chris's plan all along. That audience that loves these kind of movies, they don't want to be spoon fed that stuff. They're like, that's that feels kind of even almost insulting, you know. Trusting the audience is always the right way to go. True. We talked about working through the comedy of those codependency meetings. The action part of it, you mentioned spending a lot of time on the big fight scene at the end. I don't believe you really had a ton of experience working with that kind of material. But you did say you had some approaches to it and you have your little tricks, you know, off-speed stuff. Just tell me about the challenge of cutting action for you versus cutting comedy. And what little tricks do you employ to make that action really flow right, that the geographic relationships between the characters stays cohesive? Tell me about your approach to action. Well, in a scene like that for me, it really does help when you got stunt people that are so well choreographed. They went through that sequence so many times. Those things were laid out. They were really well designed. So as an editor, you're really just trying to speed up some of those cuts. And obviously you can go to different people at different times because you're jumping reality all over that, that sequence. But for me, it's really like finding that line through it. So everything kind of has this movement that just continues to move. Like it's, it's like when you start to like jump the line or to different areas of the sequence, that's where for me as a viewing audience, you know, I watch that stuff and it, it throws me at times. I mean, I, I'll go back to like Chris Rouse and, and those guys and like they're like pros at it. So like watching those movies, watching those Bourne movies and those chases and those action sequences and seeing why they had a little, you know, four frames of a finger pushing down on a wall and then into a punch. And like that stuff for me is like, I, I feel like you can learn so much in editing by watching what Chris Rouse and those kind of guys do in the action world. So for me, I definitely, you know, went back and watched some stuff. But a lot of that stuff was really laid out by how well it was choreographed with the stunt people. Noah had done a lot of work in that sequence. He did a fantastic job. You know, everybody kind of took passes on that action sequence. And uh, I think Noah's was probably the closest that we really worked off of. It's a fun sequence. Um, it was good to see that that sequence stayed in. My, my favorite moment in the whole thing is when when Dracula comes into the CODA meeting. Because I remember originally seeing that, that scene, how it was cut, and he just kind of came in, walked right up to Brandon, and, you know, he said his you know lines, and, and, the, and the scene kind of started where he flies up into the air. And I that's the scene for me where I was like, okay, this is this one's music, man. This is like, as soon as he comes in, you see his feet or you hear that door open, it's on. Like, it's got to be like heavy music. Scott, I grabbed some Marco stuff from like Quiet Place as my original temp. And it was like, it was cranked up. And I think when I first showed it to everybody, everybody was like, you know, <laughs> sitting back like, what the hell is this? <laughs> well, so you have a lot of tools at your disposal in doing action. You have the speed ramps, some interframe editing. Mm. There's a scene where Nicholas Holt and Aquafina are sitting down before the big finale. They're outdoors at a cafe of some kind. And somebody walks by in the foreground, occluding them, but only once. Mm -hmm. And anytime I see something like that, I'm always, I can't help but wonder, is like, wait a minute, is that a hidden edit? Do they need to make a hidden edit there for some reason? Right, right, right. It doesn't tell you anything, but I'm powerless to not ask. So <laughs> was there a hidden edit there? I don't believe there was a hidden edit in that. I, I hadn't worked on that scene in a little while, but that camera always pushed in slowly on them. 
And there was always people crisscrossing, you know, in there as it got closer and closer, then obviously they stopped, but there was always people crossing there. I don't, I'd have to look at that to see where the cut in is. Um, I know that towards the end of the movie, uh, Zine Baker came in, um, the studio wanted him to kind of go through some stuff. So he may have done something like that, but I mean, I don't, I don't think it was intentional. Maybe it was to just get to a line quicker. You know, it, it's always a tough part in the movie. Cafe Du Monde always felt like a slow scene after all this crazy stuff has happened. You need it to see Renfield kind of start to understand he's got to make a change in his life and stuff. And Aquafina, they're very similar in what they've done in their lives a bit. They have a bit of remorse. And uh, so, yeah, that may have been used to kind of jump into a line of dialogue a little bit quicker. You know, sometimes that can be elegant. Sometimes it's not. And it feels kind of cutty or something. So maybe that kind of gave you that feeling, you know. But I think at that point in the movie, we had to com start to compress to get there. So that's always a, it's always a tough gamble. You know, sometimes you're like, I hate to do this here, but we got to get to this line. You know, that kind of stuff, you know. Zine Baker, Mr. Waiter Wipe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry, Zine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> In terms of editing action and getting that nailed, I've heard a lot of editors say that when they're editing action, no sound. They want it silent so that they want to get the action right first visually, mm -hmm. and then they'll go back and do music. And then there's others who are like, no, that music is what inspires, what creates the rhythm for how I'm cutting that action. Mm -hmm. You know, how would you say that uh, you approach something like that? I'm probably more using the music for rhythm. Obviously, you know, music's always going to change, but if I'm able to give someone, especially somebody like Marco, like I'm, I used his own music just to say, Hey man, this is what I think could work here. I feel like he has, you know, certain beats in his music and whether it's percussion or whatever to kind of hit moments and like build up pieces and like I'll music edit it all just to kind of like tag a moment. So for me, I, I think I'm probably more a music based person. Like I won't, I won't like lay in the track and then lay down the cut. I'll usually lay in the cut, start looking at it, refine it, refine it, get the pieces all working. So the line is all there. Then I'll lay some music in and then start doing my adjustments to really hit on pieces of the music I'm using. You mentioned these screenings. What did you learn from these screenings as you were working on Renfield? I think the first screening we did, and this was more of an internal one for Universal, was definitely long, but it was dark, really heavy, uh, scary, uh, bit of comedy, but definitely we were laying into the dark. And I think from that, I think the studio was like, whoa, I think we want this to be definitely a little funnier and lighthearted and stuff. So Chris really will like take notes from the studio and try things, you know, I'd be like, how about this? And he's very amenable to notes. Like he's definitely not a person that's like, won't do a note. So yeah, he kind of, we kind of gathered after and said, okay, this next pass, let's try this. And so we did a full, completely different take on the movie that was definitely less dark um, in our, uh, you know, portrayal of Dracula. And I believe that that was more in the genre that they wanted to take this, you know, they wanted to slide a little bit more into the comedy side of it. So, you know, I think we did that. We learned that from that one. Then the next screening, we had a bunch of internal screenings, you know, mainly with the studio and stuff and then got their notes. And then once we hit the preview process, um, you could see that the audiences were just craving like hyper violence and like it was pretty crazy like they wanted more of that they wanted to see dracula do more destruction and uh so we started pushing a little bit more of that stuff in and uh still working refining the comedy you know in areas and getting the storylines to really connect well with you know aquafina and her sister and some of that stuff at one point they wanted to kind of like lessen that but i think people really wanted more of that they wanted to see the relationship between nick and aquafina and um you know i mean cage is always they always want more cage you know it's like that's <laughs> all they would say is like we have more nick Cage. it was just like all right you know so uh so yeah i think we learned a lot through the process that movie you could cut that movie 50 different ways no joke i mean you could have completely different movies and I think I'm, I'm happy that, you know, we came out with the one that we were working towards for sure. Let's talk about your assistant or assistants, what you ask of them and, uh, you know, how you try and help foster their careers. 
I feel like I'm pretty easy on the assistants. I want to see them doing other stuff. I want to, I don't want to see the end of the apprenticeship because I know I was able to sit with my dad and learn a bunch of stuff. And I know that when we were all cutting on film, I mean, not that I was, but I was an assistant on film that I really, those moments where you're sitting with an editor and learning the process and why they're cutting and where they're cutting is uh, a lost art. And I think it's, I like to bring that back. I like to give the power to people to, Hey, take a swipe at this scene. Show me what you got. And like, that keeps people hungry. Like they, then they're doing their assistant work and they're cutting and they're, you know, sharpening their skills and I'll bring them in, show me what you got. And we're looking at stuff and talking about it. And like, I think some editors just do their own thing and I get it. We got schedules, we got stuff to do. You don't always have time to do that. Each assistant that I've ever worked with, I'm always trying to, you know, what do you want to do? I was first always asking, what do you want to do? Do you want to be an assist? Do you want to be a career assist? Do you want to direct? Do you want to write? Like what's, you know, you have a master plan, I'm sure, or at least some idea of what it is that you really want to do. So I usually try to always dig into that first and then try to foster, you know, what angle I think they should probably try to take. And if it's editing, I'm like, cut, man, just cut. You know, if you want to cut tonight, take this scene, take a swipe at it. Let's talk about it tomorrow at lunch or, you know, whatever. And always trying to fight to get them, you know, if they, if they've done the work, additional editing credit, like Noah Cody should have an additional editing credit on this movie. He's, he did an absolute lion share of cutting on this movie, but it just didn't work out, you know, in terms of like, you know, with Mako being on and then they brought Zine on and it's like, it was unfortunate. And sometimes people don't get the credit they deserve. It's happened to me a ton of times, but yeah. you know, sometimes you just got to take what you got and move to the next one. Um, and, uh, um, so yeah, I was, I was definitely trying to get Noah an additional editing credit on it cause it was well-deserved. And in my, my assistance in the past, I had, um, a guy that was actually our PA on Alvin and the Chipmunks. And I could just tell this kid knew what he was doing. And we brought him back to LA and he had to stay with, I think, some family and that wasn't happened to be in town. And uh, he worked on that. And then he like did such a great job as just a PA and like was learning and listening to my assistants and my our VFX blockers and everybody. And he just was a sponge. You could just tell this kid was learning. And I just loved seeing that. And I was like, OK, let's talk about it. And we always talked about editing and cutting and this stuff. He went off to work at D&D &D and, and work on in VFX. And I think he did Ready Player One and uh, worked on Black Panther and like a bunch of he just like took off because he was just so hungry. And I'm like, stay hungry, keep doing it. And he is like the person that that's how it's done. Whenever I talk to people, I'm like, this is how it gets done. If you're the PA and someone says, can you go get us coffees and this and that, blah, 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 go get the coffee, do it as good as possible. Because on the next show, if you do great at that, they're going to have you do more responsibility. And I'm in a very democratic kind of working environment. Like there's no hierarchy where I work. Yeah, I'm the editor or someone else is the assistant. And then like we have PAs and stuff. But if we're slammed on stuff and you need coffee, I'm going to go get you coffee if I'm not working on something right now. The plan is to get this movie done as good and as fast as possible. And in that process, we are a team and we help each other out. Our goal is to go home to our families at night and have a work-life balance if possible. So if me going and doing things gets us out of here quicker because I don't have anything to do right now, I don't like pack up at two or three o'clock because I'm done cutting. We're a team. You know, that's how we work. So I think that they respect that in me and, um, you know, working this kid's name is Joe Fertaccia. And, that, and now he's like, he was with me on Adam. He was on Scoob. He came on Scoob as my first. He came on to Adam's family and he got an additional editing credit on that. He's jumped onto something else. We're going to work together. We want to direct stuff together. And it's just like, I met this kid in like Atlanta and uh, like chipmunks. And now he's like, you know, if we could work together on anything, we just, we have a, a good re relationship. And I think he knows that I have his back. And anybody that I think is doing the work, I'll always back them up. I, I don't take I don't take credit for people's cuts. I say, hey, you know, Noah cut this, Chris. He did a great job. And Chris is like, cool, thanks. Like, there's no like, I don't I'm not down with people that take other people's credits. I don't like poaching. I don't like editors coming in and taking other people's work and calling it their own. I've never been down with that. I think it's disrespectful, you know. So you know, as we get towards the end of these interviews, invariably I'll ask who mentored you? Now, in your case, 
come on. <laughs> so rather than ask who mentored you, I'll just, um, I'll go to, to one B on that question and ask what is the best advice about this career, about editing that you ever received from your father? Hmm. Um, that's a great question to think about. Uh, he's, he's taught me so much, but I'd probably say the one area that he really taught me the most is the politics. You know, it's really, he just said, look, everything's about politics. You got to play the politics and be smart about it. And, uh, I think he's, he was a collaborator. He definitely, like I said, he, I mean, I remember like he had me giving notes. He would grab a PA, bring them in, give them notes. He's like, there are, I guess that's the one. There are no bad notes. There's no note that you would ever give my dad where he would say like, oh, we're not doing that. He would still do it because by doing that note, you might end up over here and make the cut do this and this and unlock some key that you've been trying to unlock in this cut for so long. But you never would have gotten there if you haven't tried this note that you thought was so stupid or so bad. And eventually that note is what did this to the movie. So I, he always told me that, you know, I'm like there are no bad notes, man. You know, I believe in your bio, it says that uh, you were as a youth, an extra on the Blues Brothers. Is that true? <laughs> that is true. Yeah. OK, so you are the only person I believe I am ever going to speak to that was in the Blues Brothers. So I am not going to pass up this opportunity to ask what you remember from being on that movie. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, I think they needed some extras in front of. Oh, gosh, whose house was it? Uh, they went to uh, can't think of the name. But anyway, my sister and I were playing Frisbee on the front of the lawn of this house. You know, that was our task for the day. It was just to play Frisbee, right? It was simple. It wasn't difficult. And the Bluesmobile would pull up in front of the house. They'd jump out and then run up into the house. And that was the scene, right? You know, so my sister and I are sitting there playing Frisbee. And one of them, she throws and it kind of curves towards the street. And I'm like running and I go into the street. And here comes the Bluesmobile. I grab the Frisbee, like jump out of the way. And you can hear Landis like, Falsy! Get your kid out of here. <laughs> it's just like, I completely ruined it. You know, I was so embarrassed, but, uh, but yeah, it was pretty funny. You know, they were great. You know, I mean, I sat there, um, on set for all of that when they were in Chicago. Um, I was lucky enough to, I was, I remember sitting on the grip truck with Belushi and my dad and Aykroyd and a couple other people when they were doing the drawbridge jump and, uh, seeing Belushi like pacing back and forth and I was just a kid, you know, I just didn't know what was going on. I'm like seeing the drawbridge, watching these guys. Everyone was so nervous. I think Landis, I'm pretty sure he was like in scuba gear down inside the 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 lock or whatever, you know, like pre ready to get him I mean, because he's, he was a stuntman. And um, I just remember watching the car go up and then roll back down and then go up. And everybody was like, it just kept getting more and more tense. And then uh, finally they just gassed it and went and they went up and they put, and I think enough weight in the car to really have it turn and land correctly. And it landed and the place went nuts. Everybody was like, I mean, blue, she was just losing his mind. And it was really cool to see this like camaraderie of this massive crew for something like that. And uh, yeah, I was lucky to just be a fly on the wall when I was a kid to watch that stuff, you know, thriller too. watching stuff on thriller was pretty amazing. Michael was like unbelievable, you know? So definitely lucky there. My dad had meetings over at his house and like I would go over there and uh, it wasn't even music that I really like, like, li like I listened to it, but I wasn't like, Hey, I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan. I was listening to like really old REM or, or, you know, like, you know, that kind of stuff or, you know, Zeppelin and, you know, whatever. And I was a kid, uh, Rush, it was a big Rush man. And uh, I remember being over there. And so I, I wasn't like starstruck by him. And I think he loved that. And we just got along great. And he was so cool. He was so nice and respectful. And like, he just could not have been nicer and like being on set and watching him. I remember he was like, we were like, I think it was in Downey where they had all the train tracks coming together where they shot like the whole like, you know, dance thing. And, uh, we were sitting there and I'm just talking to Michael and he's like showing me something. I'm probably badly moonwalking for him or doing something <laughs> ridiculous. And uh, he's laughing and like, we're just cracking up. And I remember looking down, it's probably like, I don't know, one in the morning or something. And I remember looking down one of the tracks and at the end of the track, there's like a police tape and just, you know, 
hundreds of people screaming. You could just hear this faint like buzz of a crowd. And then I looked down the other one, police tape and police officers and like people down there just buzzing. And I looked down each of them and then I like looked over at him and I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's like really famous. Like I just didn't get it. And I got really nervous and I'm like, hey, hey, trying to talk normal. And it was just like, oh man, it was just, it was one of those moments in your life and just like, wow, I'm really, really blessed to be standing right here right now. It was, it was pretty cool. He was, he was an amazing human being, you know? I have no words. <laughs> Okay, so last week, we had editor Billy Goldenberg, who got roses and a personal note from comedy icon Richard Pryor. And this week, we have Ryan Folsey, who not only edits funny movies, he was in one of the biggest comedies ever as a kid. Where else are you going to get this kind of entertainment, folks? You tell me. What I'll tell you is that I had a great time getting to know Ryan and hearing about his work on Renfield. I sure hope you did, too. Hey there, young editor. I'm presuming you're young. you got to be younger than me. Have you tried the latest version of Avid Media Composer? Probably not, because a new version just came out a couple weeks ago. Do me a favor and go check it out. Come on, it's not like I'm asking for a ride to the airport or anything. Just go visit avid.com and see what's new with Hollywood's most trusted nonlinear editing system. And I will do you a favor and put a link in the show notes that will help with that. All right, I think I promised you some new voices on the show. Today marked Ryan's first appearance on the podcast, so that counts. I will try and do that again next week. Got to keep that new blood coming in. Yes, that was the last Dracula pun. It's over. I'm done. Until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>